I moved away from the logical place and then started working on myself inside. And then just all this series of crazy divine events happened. And then, so just speak, start anywhere you want in all of that. I really like that you're making it so personal because a soulmate is deeply personal. And the, the story and the process is such a deeply personal experience. And it's different for different people. So I'll give you an example, like just to start by dispelling the myth. The myth is, is that there's this soulmate, this idea that, that there's somebody out there for me. I, I was, uh, this weekend, we were talking about it. And I'll talk about this, spe this guest speaker that we had this weekend, because I want to talk about a project that I'm working on with him later. But he, someone asked him, is there such a thing as soulmate? And he looks at the person, and these are to university students, because we deal primarily with university students here. And he says to him in university language, your soulmate is FOMO meaning fear of missing out, that you have this myth inside of your head that you have this soulmate and therefore whoever is actually here in front of you is not good enough for you because there must be someone better. And we kind of create this story in our heads and in our hearts that maybe there's someone better out there for us. So the, a soulmate is as powerful to us as it is where we are, our level. So the so I, so I'll, I'll talk about him. Um, I'm working on this project with this uh, psychologist in Jerusalem. His name is Dr. Asael Romanelli, and I'm going to quote him a few times throughout our, our conversation today because I think that some of the stuff he does is so in touch with this Geula component and so in touch with the Hasidus component of what we're talking about. And he has great words to describe some of the concepts that we are so in touch with. And sometimes I think when it comes to these concepts, we have to look a little bit outside of ourselves and say like, what's really going on? So the, he uses the word differentiation. Differentiation is the ability to be authentically myself while in a relationship with someone else. This ability that I have to be authentically myself, so, so often, and he says that the person we're going to attract to ourselves is not going to be more we differentiate. It's not going to be more differentiated than we are. Hmm. In other words, not more. Could you define it one more time? So differentiation is the ability to be authentically ourselves while carrying, while being in a relationship with someone else. So that's two, um, two, uh, two obviously two opposite poles. So you're saying that the research shows that that wherever you are in your ability to be authentically yourself and to be in an intimate relationship will draw only people, someone else who's, who's at that same level and not beyond. Exactly. So that must mean there must be at all times a bunch of different versions of your soulmate. Oh, interesting. Whoa. Depending on how soulful you are, depending on how differentiated you are, hmm. depending on how much work you've been able to do on yourself, you're gonna attract someone who's done that same amount of work to themselves. Wow. Or on themselves. That's amazing. So what happens if two people, uh, the logical question, what happens if two people are in a relationship or are married and one of them does work and the other one doesn't? Well, so one of the things that I think, um, and, and I've been realizing this more and more, is this emotional intimacy. He says, intimacy is into me see. Hmm. The ability to see into myself. And there's so many people, I see this with couples that I counsel, where you have, they're married 10, 15, 20 years, and all of a sudden they turn around and they realize that they were just roommates. They weren't really intimate. Geula is the ability to be intimate. Hmm. Which means, so, you know, sh shalom, we, we call it shalom yeah. bayit. That's the term, which means peace in the home. If there's, if, you know, and Shalom Bayit, we say, is one of the things that brings the Gula. So peace in the home. If there's Shalom, if there's peace, there must be war. So what's the mm. war? The war between husband and wife? Or is the war between ourselves and ourselves? Is the it's war within both. both, right? So differentiation is so important. It's the ability to first be able to, to, to understand, to say the thing, to understand who I am, and eventually, as much as I can understand myself, is how I'm going to be able to be intimate with my partner. 
well, which really speaks to my own experience that actually withdrawing from the outside and going, making changes on the inside immediately changed the outside. Do you, do you find that that happens a lot? Or mm -hmm. is my story like specifically, yeah? Is right. it almost is it almost predictable that if somebody does deep work on themselves, they're <laughs> they draw to them a, a relationship? I know that everybody says that they're unique and special, and and your story is so <laughs> unique and so special. But I'm sorry to say that it's the same story, different face. Oh, I'd I'd love to hear that actually, because when people when people write me, or I know people in the world who are you know people in my life who have who are lonely, who have not been able to you know to find that soulmate, so to speak, um, that, that good relationship. And I, sometimes I tell them my story and I always feel like, you know, is it gonna work for them? Is that, or was it a one-time thing? So, so speak to that, to talk about that from your point of view and maybe if you have some more examples of, of times when that, when that happened. And I guess it's well, not only soulmates, I guess it's everything in life. Every kind of, it's, it's, and especially when it comes to relationships because relationships are so fundamental to who we are. I mean, even Maslow put it in his hierarchy of needs. It's a basic need, the ability to have a relationship. And, you know, so often I think that we, we get into this, this rhythm and it becomes very exterior. We, we live in this world where everything is on the outside. Everything is, you know, what is it gonna be you know, how am I, what's my image? How am I looking? You know, even right now, look, we're looking, oh, you know, people can see us in this video. Yeah. How do I look? Am I the right thing? I'm looking at myself in the video right now. Oh, do I look Oh, is you, you're thinking that too? <laughs> do I look good? Uh, you know, is my hat uh, put on the right way? Oh my gosh, can everybody see all the terrible books that I have behind me? They're gonna start judging me for the books that I have behind me. I don't know if they can see the titles. They're gonna say, oh, why does the rabbi have that Probably book? Probably not. <laughs> but are you really thinking that uh, do you yeah. actually really think that well can't we say the thing yes i do think that of course don't we once again i thought it was just me yeah no i do <laughs> <laughs> the ability to kind of call it out and say the thing right isn't that powerful that we yeah. can say to whoever is here I mean, even just to say it to each other yeah that is what we're really thinking about and the funny thing is is the whole world is walking around thinking what does everyone think of me no one is actually thinking of you no one really cares how you look because they're just thinking about how they how look they in look. your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's all so giant we're all, mirror. We're all in these, these fake, it's almost like this, it's a real smoke and mirrors. It's a real, as they, that's what they call in Hollywood. It's like this real fake world. And, and the ability to be emotionally connected to someone else is the ability to kind of step over ourselves to step beyond ourselves and try to connect with someone else in a very powerful, in a very authentic way. That's difficult. That's difficult. It means that I have to be somewhat in touch with myself in order to be able to connect with someone else. So if I spent so many years, I, I love the word, I love the word in, in, in Hasidic philosophy, the word taiva, because taiva is a great example of our society. Taiva means a lust but it's more than a lust. It's a lust that we have no reason for. And actually, so we can totally relate to like the taiva, like, you know, I was, I was at a Friday night dinner and there was tiramisu and there was a really nice, it was homemade nice. tiramisu, it looked so good. And I, I couldn't help myself. Do I need it? Actually, if my brain was thinking of it, I would say, why are you having this tiramisu? Like, yeah, but it looks good. And it was Shabbat and there's no Shabbat calories, right? That's what everyone tells me. So therefore it must've been amazing and I have it. That's a taiva. But the, ta the ability to have self-control is a muscle. And if we don't exercise that muscle of self-control, mm -hmm. we're, not, we're not gonna be able to have the self-control and other things in our lives. But what's incredible to me is that that is why God created this world according to Kabbalah, according to Hasidus. That God created this world because God had a taiva. The same way I have a lust, God also has a lust. And the, same, and the same way that God has that lust and that's what created this world, I have the ability to have that choice. That choice is such a powerful thing that it's all that I really own.
And when we because, don't make a choice, it's wait, awesome. wait, you you lost me somewhere um, in terms of how come God's lust gives me a choice. But I also wanted this good point to interject because Devin is running the video I'm from YouTube onto Facebook now, so I don't know if that if you need okay. to do anything yeah, based I, on that. I saw yeah, that. So how so how come up. God how come God's lust gives me choice? God's lust gives me choice because first of all, like how do you explain? It? I I was talking. I, maybe you'll appreciate this. Sorry, a sidebar. I'm I'm side. I'm I'm going on a tangent off your tangent. So this is the tangent. Great. That's how it goes. That's how it works. <laughs> so so I was having this uh, very very uh, philosophical discussion on Friday night, and somebody says to me, Rabbi, you're such a uh, you know. He starts giving me all these compliments. I'm like, okay, thank you very much. What do you want to know? He's like, oh, you know, how do you, such a thinking person, a intelligent person, how do you believe in God? So I said, tell me the truth. How much time have you spent in your life thinking about God? How much time? 20 minutes, a half an hour? I mean, you're obviously agnostic or atheist or whatever you want to call yourself. How much time have you spent thinking about God? Five hours? I spent about an hour to two a day struggling with my relationship with God. You have nothing to talk about. Until you start spending an hour or two if you want to start talking about science, you probably spend an hour or two a day struggling with science. I'm not going to talk about my relationship with science because I don't have a relationship with science. But I definitely have a struggling relationship with God. And I spend a lot of time talking about it. And I think that it's important that we start off by saying we can't start challenging something unless we've struggled and wrestled with it. That is what Jacob and Israel, that is that relationship. Jacob, he who wrestles with God, becomes Israel because that process of wrestling with God. So let's say that God exists. We're, we're creating, if you haven't had the ability to struggle and wrestle with it, you're going to have to take my word for it because I've been doing it for a while. So we have this, this struggle, this inner struggle. Now God, now let's, let's understand God. God had this taiva. He wanted a dwelling place in the lower realms. Why? I don't know. I don't know why I wanted that tiramisu. I really wanted it. Did I need it? Definitely not. Did my brain say the calories, the schmalories? It went on and on and on. I don't know. But that same, ex I cannot, unless I really love that tiramisu, and I'm just using the tiramisu as, a, as an allegory, but unless I can really understand that, and then, and then you have that, you know, so it's like, okay, I'm sorry that I'm, I'm backtracking. So, I was thinking to myself when the tiramisu was put in front of me, I'm going to have a little self-control because I'm a person of self-control and I'm going to have a little peace. But can this I, a true story? Yes, this really happened Friday night. <laughs> good. <laughs> I have a little tiny piece of tiramisu. It was really good. And I'm like, okay, fine. I'm going to have another little piece of tiramisu and then another little piece. Can I tell you I had more tiramisu than that one piece in front of me because of all the little pieces that I had. We all know this story. But if... I can't understand that, and there's no brain in my heart, but my heart desired it. Well, in the anthropomorphic terms, that's how God desired this world. Hmm. And I know that we're talking about some very deep ideas in a very <laughs> peripheral way because we're talking about tiramisu, but I think that there's such a powerful experience. And if we can't experience that, then we can't experience the way that God desires this world and the, the way that God desires us to have choice in this world, which is the second part that you said that you didn't understand. Okay, so, that's great. So I just wanna I just want to recap a little bit just to make, I mean, actually I've never heard it, I've never heard it described in terms of tiramisu. And it's, <laughs> a, it's, it's truly a, it's, it's great because it highlights a, the intensity, the, even if on a human level, that it overrides, it's super rational, it overrides all consciousness, all thinking. It's just coming from, I want, I want, and from pleasure, the pleasure of getting what you want, right? It's also associated with that. Okay, yeah, so stage two, the choice. Stage two is choice. God gave us one thing, and that's the ability to choose. No other creation guides us humans have the ability to choose. Now, if we don't make a choice, that's also a choice. There's passive choices and there's active choices. So that ability to choose is a very powerful thing. Sorry that there's getting, uh, I don't know how to get rid of this uh, these sounds on my computer. 
It's a nice I tried song. To close, I tried to close everything, but people Don't like, worry. It's fine. Okay. Don't worry about it. So God, God gave us the ability to choose. And that ability to choose, if it's understood that every choice also has another choice. There needs to be exact opposites in the world. Someone say like, how can evil exist? Evil needs to exist for us to have true free choice. Mm. Free choice is not a metaphor. It's not an idea. It right. really exists. So if there's something extremely good in the world, there must be something to balance that out. As we say it in, in, in Hasidic terms, Zelu umad zeh, there needs to be a counterpart to everything. And, and a counterpart needs to be equal on the scale. It needs to be, if there's something on this side, there needs to be something on this side. Right. Which almost nothing is in actual reality. Or maybe it's because some, for some reason in our world, we think that the world began the day we were born, the world will end the day we die, and while we're alive, we think all the, the world only exists the way that we can see it. But while you're alive, there's a world that's out there that you can't see. And before you were born, there's also a world that you can't see. And after you're going to leave this world, there's also a world you can't see. So the fact that you exist in this world means that there's purpose and it gets into a whole different conversation about purpose. If you want to go there, we can go there too. But how do you find two things that are, okay, continue talking about choice because my understanding of choice is that, as you say, two things have to be exactly equal, but almost never are two things exactly equal. The, the potential for two things to be equal has to exist, mm. which means in the world, there is something that's opposite to your choice. Maybe not in your world, maybe not. Mm. Oh, I see what you're saying. But it does exist in the world because that's mm. the way God created this world. This world okay. is perfectly balanced. I mean, I, I can use extreme examples, but I think that there's, everyone can use their own examples. Because the example I was, thinking was a Holocaust example, so I don't want to use it. Mm, good. <laughs> okay, so continue. So think about, think about the ability for choice for a minute. The ability that we have to make a choice. When you make the choice, do you weigh the pros and cons? Well, sometimes we do. But what ends up happening is a lot of the stuff that we know inherently, we can't feel. How do we create that balance? And this is, I, I think, going to the next step of the Gula experience. There's this synthesis between mind and heart, where we can actually have shalom bayit, we can have peace in our own home when there's a synthesis between mind and heart. So I, right now, for example, as you're watching me and we're having this discussion, and same here, my mind is wandering. When you're talking, my mind is wandering. Maybe you're thinking about how to respond to me. Maybe you're thinking about the next question. Maybe you're looking at someone's question that they just asked you on your screen. So you're barely just kind of like trying to be the moderator. And I'm just kind of calling it out. Sorry that I'm focusing on you. You're the only one in front of me right now. <laughs> I hope you're- That's what I was focusing on, that the Facebook's not working. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> in part. <laughs> so imagine if there was no extraneous noise, there was nothing, there was nothing there. All there was, was the present, the moment, the ability to be in this moment. Nothing extraneous, nothing that's all the noise, you just kind of take it out, all the questions, everything, just the ability to be in this moment. Your, your mind is still gonna wander. Now, what if we can take this idea, let's say any idea, the idea of, of being in the moment, just taking out the future. There's nothing that existed before this moment. There's nothing that's going to exist after this moment. Just being in this moment. And then we start feeling it. I want to feel, well, what is it like to be in this moment? I have anxiety. I'm feeling anxious. That's a powerful moment. That's a powerful experience because I just took an intellectual idea and brought it down into my heart. I don't have a brain in my heart. So once it reaches my heart, I'm gonna have a really hard time trying to figure out how to intellectualize it, but that's not the point. The point is there should be a synthesis. We call it chachma bina da'at. The, 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 the idea of taking an idea and then making it into the practical, being able to really 
bring it into our being to the point where we can actually make it part of our emotions. But once it reaches our emotions, we have no idea what's going to happen. So in, in, in Dr. Romanelli's terms, I love how he says, he says, let it land. Let it land. And that's from the world of improv. Because in improv, the most important thing is, besides the yes and, is first to let it land. Let what someone else is saying influence you. Become vulnerable a little bit. And so often in our lives, we don't allow influence. We have these very strong barriers that we put up between ourselves and the other person. Because or ourselves and ourselves. That's how I was first hearing it. Or ourselves and ourselves. Thank you for saying that. I wasn't even going to go that far, but we have these don't barriers because we're trying, we're trying to protect that inner child in the Freud word or that adaptive child. We, we're somehow we're, we're, we're in the state of protection and state, instead of the state of vulnerability that allow us to grow and become better people. And this obviously started, if we're speaking from about Geula, where, where I, I frequently look at the beginning of Gullis, which makes sense, the Eitz Hadas, it's the eating from the tree of knowledge. That's where this all happened, where we started hiding from ourselves. I've been thinking about it a lot, especially in the last few days, I guess because of the summit that when something gets triggered, we tend to bounce out of it, try to manage it, try to push it away, try not to feel it rather than go into it where it seems like the healing and the secrets are inside of it. Is that, is that aligned with what you're saying? You know, we're, 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 we need to, def to a certain extent, we have to have a little bit of a barrier because the world is a scary place. So, but the problem I find the problem or the potential solution that I find is that we guard ourselves in the wrong times and we become vulnerable in the wrong times. Maybe. And we have to think about when is it proper to guard ourselves? The guard is important. We need to be able to navigate the world. We need to have the proper, you know, the, the, the proper ability to, but what about this idea of differentiation? Are, am I guarding myself when I'm supposed to be vulnerable? What is intimacy? What is intimacy? Is the ability that I can become vulnerable. I can show my shadow to my partner and they still love me unconditionally. I can show so many different parts of myself to my partner and they still love me. That's a very, you know, I can, I can show the, 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 the raw side of myself, the difficult, the anxious part, the, the part that I don't show anyone. In order to, we have to become vulnerable if we wanna be in, a, in, a, in an authentic relationship. If we wanna be in a differentiated relationship, we have to show a vulnerable side and that's scary because maybe our partner is gonna spit it back in our face. But I think it's, I think the scary part, and this is what I was speaking to a moment ago, I think the scary part is, I think it begins, in between ourselves and ourselves. Quick example, something happened this morning where I reached out to somebody uh, in a certain way and they, they misunderstood me and they answered a little bit sharply and it triggered me. Um, and it was my text, so I didn't respond, but I was feeling, I was feeling so uncomfortable and I, and I was trying to calm myself down inside. And, and, you know, and then I remembered that, that I wanna go in to the feeling instead of bounce out or push it away or manage it or explain it away. And so I sat down for a minute and I asked myself, what is this feeling? And it was shame. Somehow, it, you know, as a core, it just, it's there. It got triggered for no, almost no reason, but it happened. And as soon as I, you know, as soon as I went into it and recognized it for what it is, and that's what I call, you know, snake energy. Like this is all the veil between ourselves and ourselves, what separates us, what keeps us from being truly authentically ourselves, like you're saying. It just, it, it shifted without, um, without any need to explain it, but it didn't shift away. It shifted in. And instead, I, instead of feeling that like uh, uncomfortability, I felt this really happened. This is really true. I felt kind of an emergence of a much deeper self and, um, and a deep connection to, to God, to, you know, to that inner and that inner awareness. And it was very fast and it was very interesting. It's, it, it feels like things are always able to go to a new level. So I'd say if you're talking about differentiation, giving the definition that you gave, it, one thing is how we, what we allow or what we make, or what we expect or what we can count on from someone else, how we are in our relationship. But I'm thinking, I'm looking 
at the first thing that you said to be our authentic selves. It's not just to express our feelings, that's a level of it, but it's also what's inside of our feelings, I think. It's very powerful. And, and, and I'm trying to, you know, I, I, I closed my eyes for a bit while you were talking to really allow what you're saying to, to land and to allow myself to emotionally take on mm. this part and to learn something new from you even through this process. Wow. And I, 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 something that kind of hit me is this is the second time you said it's a true story. Is there this, are we, do we live in this fake, such a fake world that we just think the stories that people tell us aren't true? Maybe. At least people who are, maybe not so much in a personal setting, but maybe, um, maybe more in a teaching setting or in a performing or showing up publicly setting. I don't know, I hadn't thought about it. I mean, obviously the quick yeah, answer is uh, yes, there, but, but uh, usually if people yeah, tell I, me a story about themselves, I think it's true, I assume it's true. But yeah, there's something to what you're saying. Yeah. We, we right now so often when people present they're in this self-presentation mode not in this authentic self mode right How do, that is that's being properly differentiated being able mm -hmm. to be in, in an authentic space while being in self-presentation like there's every reason not to be real right now a lot of people are watching us or we think so we don't know i at least i don't know maybe you do <laughs> and we we have this this you know all the the world is saying to us be in self presentation be that person be that whatever it is this is hollywood right it's all about acting but how do we still maintain that authenticity while being in self presentation mode that's differentiation mm -hmm. even in this relationship between the two of us and the person who is watching or listening right now, that's such a powerful thing because if we're not able to reach that, then the words that we say are not gonna enter the heart. The words right. that we say are not gonna affect anyone. So what are we even doing here if we can't reach that, that level of authenticity? True, it's true. I don't like being comfortable in this silent space. It's good. It's a good space to be in. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I can ask another question. I'm just letting it land. <laughs> um, uh, okay. All right, so so here you're describing, I interrupted with my own thoughts on the connection between self and self, but you're talking Very about- Very good, very good thoughts. You're talking about a relationship. You're, you're talking about choice. You're talking about how, about free choice, choice between two things. Then you're talking about relationship between I'm assuming man and woman or even friend and friend like at any re a relationship with a partner so how does that weave together or where did you want to go with that so so going back to choice so I let's go into maybe in something practical so I see a lot of singles because it's kind of become a little bit of my work I, I never I never thought this was going to be uh, so much of my work but it has been and I see that a, a lot of a lot of singles are blocked. They're just blocked for whatever reason. Maybe the everything you need to be in a relationship is exactly the opposite of what you need to be a good dater. Hmm. Uh, maybe they're asking the wrong questions. Maybe they're looking, maybe they're not differentiated. Maybe they're looking for the wrong things. I mean, I, I, I'm not gonna go, I mean, I can tell you from my experience, all the things that I see, but there's a lot of things that that, that singles are facing today. And especially since we live in a different world, we live in a world where you don't have to get married, where you're fine if you're, if you're alone. Mm -hmm. But in order to be in a differentiated state, in order to be in a state of choice, in order to be in a real state, you can't do that unless you can be able to get into a relationship with someone else and they can see your shadow. That is Gula. That is why we use, even at Sinai, we use the, the, the Sinai experience of the Jewish people getting the Torah as a relationship, as a marriage between God and the Jewish people. That we're the female in, in the relationship and uh, the, 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 the traditional female and God is the male. That's why we call God he, not because we're trying to be patriarchal. It's because 
we are in a relationship with God and God is our husband. And you're using your, uh, I think I see you using this, this idea. Now I'm seeing the connection that you're saying that to have a proper relationship with the creator and fulfill the desire, his desire in, in us is that we have to be ourselves and be able to be, to show our, to be able to trust and show our, our shadow self to him, or am I jumping? Show our shadow, our shadow self first to someone else. Ah. Because showing our, the, using our relationship as a metaphor with our relationship with God. We have to first, if we can't call out our failures, if we can't call oh, out our- interesting. If we can't show our shadow self, to someone else, how can we show it to God? Oh, people say, well, my relationship with God is a private situation. That's beautiful. Have your private relationship with God. But do you have a relationship with someone else that's also private? Do you have a significant other who, who knows that and still loves you, even though they know the parts of yourselves that are most vulnerable? What if the answer is no? That's hard. Then you're not in a relationship. Then. You're just two people that kind of gliding through life together. What and if that's the case? If, I wouldn't Sorry, be surprised if, if, if 15 years later, you come in to my office and you're like, we have nothing in common. Of course you have nothing in common. You were never intimate. Maybe physically intimate, but not emotionally intimate. So it makes sense. You have all these, all these couples that all of a sudden are having this realizations that they have nothing in common. But you're making the case, I think, that without this kind of, without differentiation, which means a relationship with yourself that's authentic, a relationship with somebody else that's authentic, you can't have a real relationship with God. Is that the case that you're making? I don't know. I mean, I, it is the case that I'm making, but it's not, it's, it's, it's not my unique case. This is, you know, this is very, very much based in Hasidus and Kabbalah. This is the case that we make. We, this is why we use it as a metaphor. And I'm saying let's, we have to stop using it. The same thing with the stories. Stop using them as metaphors and looking, looking at them as real life. So then what, so my next question is then you, you're, I understand more about why you would be in this because um, it definitely fits with your, you know, with your belief system, your values, your learning. Um, but what, but what do you do as a person, as a counselor, when someone comes to you and says, "I don't have anyone in my life," or what, or, and or what do you do? That's a harder case. What do you do when someone comes in and says, I, "I'm married to an abusive person," or "I'm married to a closed person," or my spouse has Asperger's, whatever it might be? If that's not just blocking the relationship, that's blocking the relationship with God, according in the line with this premise. So, what do you do, and what does that person do? We always have choice. We don't find ourselves in situations. The Rebbe once told Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, we put ourselves in situations and we maintain those situations. What, in order to be able to change, you, in order to have what we call second order change, most of what we do is first order change. In order to have second order change, we need to have more losses than gains. As long as we have more gains than losses, as long as we're in a relationship, let's say that's an abusive relationship or a relationship that that is self-serving or we're, we're with a narcissist, which is very common today. The people who are with those narcissists, they have more gains than losses. There's more reasons to be in the relationship than not to be in the relationship. And it could be so many things. And I'm not here to judge. I just want to right. call it out. I want to say the thing. No, we're looking at the template, but okay. I know I'm going to get questions. I don't mean to interrupt. Please hold your thought, but I know I'm going to get questions about this because I, and I'm sure you do also, I hear from people who are suffering like, Somebody's going to ask me, what if, a, if, if someone has a child that's born damaged, God forbid, does that mean that they are keeping themselves in the situation or if someone tried and tried and didn't meet someone, they're keeping, let's bring it down all the way. Okay, so there, there's exceptions to every rule, obviously, and we have no choice but to generalize. I hate generalizing. I'd rather speak to one person, speak to a person, because every person is unique and every person is special and every situation is special and unique. So I don't want to start generalizing, but for the sake of this conversation, we have to generalize. So if there's a situation where there's someone that's born with a particular thing, I, obviously we're not talking about that. We're talking about a person who has more gains than losses and keeps themselves in a situation by choice or lack of choice, going back to our initial conversation, that um, will, ma will maintain that. And the reason why they're keeping themselves in that situation is because at this point, they have more gains than losses. 
And that's the, a only perfect... way, okay. the only way to create what we're going to call second order change is to have more losses than gains. And what's that's first hard. order change? What is first order change and what's second order change? First order change means we're making changes within our lives. We're, we're I want to make a change. Uh, I'm going to the gym because I want to lose weight. That's a first order change. Okay. okay I see you lose weight. A second order change is changing the way I eat, changing the way I, my whole attitude towards weight loss. Changing- So more, more whole, inner, more like more the operating system. system. I mean, sorry. I'm using, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry that I'm interrupting you. Um, I'm interrupting the, you. Depends on how you look at it. Right. <laughs> For, from my side of the screen or your side of the screen. <laughs> Um, it's more of, it's more of, let's say, let's say I, I mean, let, let's use an extreme example and I'm not here to start outing people, but I know they're already thinking like this. So I'm just going to say it. If you're in an abusive relationship and you can't leave first order change is to try to go to a therapist and to try to figure out how to mm -hmm. deal with your abusive relationship. But if okay. it's with a narcissist and someone who is not going to change second order change would be leaving that person. Now leaving that person is gonna come with a whole stream of issues and things that would be very complicated. And I, okay, I understand that, I understand that, but don't come to me as a victim and start saying, oh, I'm a victim and look at me and oh, poor me, which is what often happens. And I'm not saying men or women, I'm not saying that this is more common in one because I've seen them with both men and women. But the victim triangle, which is a whole different concept that we can talk about um when, when you when you triangulate and when you and and when you turn yourself into a victim which is very common it is a response and that is a first order change a second order change is saying i'm not a victim i'm in control this is my life and i'm going to do what is necessary that's second order change but there's no applause for second order change no one's going to clap no one's going to pat you on the back no one's going to make you feel better and that's why among so many other things, there's so many more gains than losses to stay in the current situation that you're in. Why, this is a conversation I've never had before. So that's why I'm asking so many questions to make sure I understand. And I'm sure other people might have the same questions. Why is it that nobody would applause? I, I, see, I see that you're saying that one first order change is a change in a, a detail in a system, in, a, in an environment, in a context that exists. The context doesn't change something changes, a detail, some aspect. And then you're, I think you're defining second order change as a change in the context. You move out of this context, you go to a whole new context. Why is it that nobody would applause? That seems like very courageous. Well, I mean, I, I use an extreme example. It could be that someone who leaves, some people, let's say who have done it will applause them. Mm. But in yourself, there's gonna be a lot, of, you're leaving a lot of things. People who, who leave abusive relationships, especially relationships, and I'm sorry that we're using all these examples, and I, I, I hope that people, most people are not in such extreme situations. So I hope that we're able to synthesize this and apply it to our own situation, which is not quite as extreme. But it doesn't, have to be, it doesn't even have to be relationships. You're talking have, about the soul. You're talking about, I mean, we talk about the, this is called love relationships and, and, and the story of the soul. And this is exactly, and it, this relates Clearly, it relates to Giul, it relates to the revelation of God's desire within our life and that relationship at, through all the other relationships. So, 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 let's, so, so let's talk about the soul, because I, I don't like using this extreme example, because maybe people can't relate to it. The, the, for me to change in my life, to make it, I, I do a lot of first order change. First order change, I do it all the time. I want to become better. I want to use this, you know, self-control. I'm not going to eat the tiramisu. Yay, I win. I didn't eat the tiramisu. Hmm. But to, to exercise that muscle of taiva, that muscle of lust, of self-control to the point where the tiramisu is not even a conversation anymore. There's no applause for that. Inwardly, because I feel, okay, I don't want to, maybe we're having different experiences. I feel like- But push it, I like this. For the, for the when, I, when I can experience, I mean, way back when, when I first became, observant, I, they used to talk a lot about how um, learning Hasidus, learning mystical Torah, if, if you could change one of your character traits at the core, that's like a life's work. 
So when you're talking about a second order change, it could, and you're describing losing a taiva for something, losing that lust for something, so that it's no longer being generated from within your system, you've changed something at the root, or at least some level of root. To me, if we're talking about the way I would feel at accomplishing something like that, that's like a profound joy, pride, celebration, connection, gratitude. What, how I can see, how I can see what you're saying is, in the process of making a first order change, it's all like rah rah, yeah, wow, I did that, and you're staying in a secure, happy, or stable, you know, solid situation and getting better in it. So that feels good. That's like simcha. That's like joy, celebration. Right. And when you're making a move out of a certain situation on a much deeper level, like out of an abusive relationship, which is a very valid example, or out of um, a whole way of being around something, the process of doing that, or the fallout from the initial move from one plane of being to another plane of being, that doesn't feel good. That feels almost like melting down. Let me, right? let me, let me can I, but when can you I, get there, yeah, shit, please. Can I, can, I, can I push back and maybe ask you a personal question? Yes. At some point in your life, you made a, a huge change, a second order change from being whatever they call, not, I don't even know what this means, not religious to religious, Baal Teshuva, it's a whole different conversation, you know, or, or, or going from not observance of the Torah and mitzvot or little observance, I don't like to say no observance, little observance to more observance. Right. What did your mom think of that? My mom, um, well, it had already happened to my brother, so she was a little bit broken in. So what, what she, your brother did- She did what, cry. She, we all thought he was crazy. It was very disruptive. And now that you mention it, it was very disruptive to my life because I, I, didn't, I didn't eat where I used to eat. I didn't, do, I didn't hang out with who I used to hang out. In fact, I ended up moving from Minnesota to New York and it was a massive change and it took a while to rebuild. Did the second order change get applause? Um, initially, well, from the people who were already there, yes. <laughs> the people who from, were already there, but that's getting propped up. Oh, that's what you said. You said that's that. You said that. By the club. We're not yeah, going right. to come out from the people who matter most. Oh, from wow. Mom, from your mom. Wow. So this is every trail breaker. Every person who leaves a system and, and leans into a new system where most people aren't is, you're saying, not going to get applause. That's very interesting. Okay. I'll give, I'll give you that. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for going so personal, but that's- No, the, that's it's great. Really it's the cute. best. All right, so, so second order change. So, and how does this have to do with the relationship with the differentiation? So going back to differentiation, going back to choice, going back to second order change. I always say that you are the common denominator in all your failed relationships. It's the realization. I know it's hard for a lot of singles to hear that. I have to, if we're singles to let that land, it's hard because to, to take responsibility. It's so easy to say it's someone else's fault. Oh, that guy, that girl, that man, that woman, that person, oh my gosh. And I hear all the stories and maybe they're right, but you are the common denominator in that story. You existed in that story, you existed in that story. And so often we have the same person, different face. And we keep on doing this. We keep on getting into these relationships and these cycles because we stay in first order change. We're not, so we have to at some point say, hold on a second. I am the common denominator in all my failed relationships. This is about me. What am I doing wrong? What can I do to change? And that's hard because that's admitting that there's something wrong with me and that I'm actually a person in this relationship. And it's not the, what we think about and what singles are generally looking for in their relationships are so outside of themselves. They're so about self-presentation. Everything's about self-presentation. I wanna this. I hear these laundry lists. I, I can't even tell you what people are looking for. And I wanna just shake them a little bit and say, if you really knew what was important in a relationship, you wouldn't even ask half of these questions. So looking at that single and looking at that person and saying in, in myself, I have been doing this let's say for singles who've been doing this for years, some people have been dating people for years and years and the same thing keeps on happening. Why am I attracting these kind of people to my life? Great question, let it land. 
Why am I attracting these kind of people to my life? Don't ask it for an answer. Ask it for an inner answer. Why am I attracting mm. these kind of people into my life? Why does this keep happening to me? Is there something about me that this is happening to me? Instead of guarding yourself, instead of protecting yourself, become vulnerable with yourself for a moment. And you're asking it like a question, not like a judgment. Because usually if you say, why is this happening to me? We could, the brain will come up with a lot of reasons. Because you're this, you're that, you're not that. All the defense mechanisms come in. Right. And that's where we are, first order change, not second order change. Mm. We keep on getting all the defense mechanisms. Oh, by the way, we love ourselves and no one will love ourselves more than we love ourselves, not even our moms. Maybe our moms. So it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to become vulnerable with ourselves, but that's Gaula. Hmm. And then how that is second order change because you're changing the structure of the way, the core structure of the way that you view yourself and you view relationships. What do you think? I think, yes, I'm just asking in your model. I think absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think when you drop into a different, deeper belief or a deeper way of looking at things, if it's significant, it, 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 re it flips things around. It always reorganizes everything. So that has to be second order. Well, so one of the listeners asked a question, which I also have, and that is what if a person doesn't come to what, what if somebody comes to you and they're like and let's say they're let's say they're I don't know they, they could be young probably a lot of people come to you or yet are college students but let's say they're not let's say it's a mother of a college student or something who um or somebody somebody you know 50 60 whatever 40 who doesn't have a relationship who has been yearning for such a long time hasn't found anybody what would you say in this context I would have to start the process our do you have more gains than losses? In not having a relationship? Yeah. People who are single become very comfortable in their own space. Hmm. You know, it, and, and they're they, singles, especially singles who are, uh, who are been single for a long time, they become very comfortable in that space. I, sometimes I have to say to the singles, I want you to clear out half of your closet. I want you to sleep on one side of your bed. I want you to sit at one chair at your table. I want you to feel like there's something missing in your life. As long as you are full of yourself, there's no space for someone else. And how often do you have this situation? How often do you have this particular conversation? Maybe four times a day. Okay, uh, I'm gonna boldly ask you, um, how often, what percentage of the time, if people actually follow your advice, do you find that they meet somebody that they would like to spend their lives with? depends on how they follow the advice. Everyone is, it responds to it differently. I, I like to be direct. I'm very, that's, I don't want to beat around the bush. We have no time. The world is in a Google state. The, the Rebbe said the fire is burning. When the fire is burning, you don't ask questions of how to, how to, how to, you just take your hose and you, you do what you have to do and, and blow it out. So I, I don't have time to beat around the bush. Therapy is wonderful. Some people need therapy. It's wonderful. I'm not a therapist. So mm -hmm. I'm not expecting a therapy. So I'm going to say it as it is, how I see it. You know, I'm going to use my, my, my laser eyes to see it, see it, and you can go to your therapist and deal with the rest of it. Okay, but th this, this really is connected to, what, to the story that I told when I said, I don't know if it's, if it's just me, and you said, no, it's universal. So I'm really trying, let's say somebody does follow the prescription. I'm looking for the formula, like from your experience, okay. if somebody pretty much follows what you say, are they likely, like, I'm wondering if, you know, there's a fear of, I fear for other people, arousing the feeling of being missing something, and then if it doesn't show up, you're in pain. Let's just say, um, let's first talk about what I, what I would say before, like, let's, right. like, let's okay. say, what would I say? So there's a number of things. Number one is um, what I say is not my own. I don't make this stuff up. So um, I look at what the Rebbe would say to people during, uh, so first of all, the Rebbe would often say, that they have to do something physical, take on, become what they what we call a keli, become a vessel for a blessing. If you want a blessing, you need to have a vessel that's going to hold that blessing. So there are particular things the Rebbe would say to different people. And there's about, I don't know, 20 things 
if you want, I can, I, you can post it on your blog. I can send you all those 20 things that, 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 uh, that I've collected um, of those things and you can decide. Yes, please. And, and most of those things have to do with going out of your comfort zone. The rebel would say, for example, give to a needy bride beyond your means. Going out of your comfort zone. Give a certain amount of charity every day. Take on an extra bit of learning. Take on a, a, a you know specific learning of Hasidus, which is going to help you introspect. Um, the, the, you know we have to become a vessel who want a blessing. Marriage, finding a significant other, is a huge blessing. Maybe outside of children, it's probably the greatest blessing that can be given. So with a, a blessing that size, we need a nice size vessel. If there's no space in your life for someone else, then you got to empty the vessel. A lot of our vessels are filled with junk. Sometimes you got to empty the vessel to create the space for someone else. And part of that is creating the Kaylee, creating that, creating that vessel to be able to get the blessing. I'm just giving you a couple of examples. So the first thing I would, I would say to someone is you need to make a physical vessel and there are specific things you can do to make that physical vessel. The next thing is you have to make an emotional vessel. And the third thing is you have to make sure that you know what you're looking for. There's a um, Gottman, John Gottman, John and Julie Gottman, they do a lot of uh, research. He's a scientist, she's a psychotherapist, and they do a lot of research on relationships. They've written a number of books. I love their books and I love their research. Uh, and one of the things they, they recently came out with in one of their studies is that they believe that in, if you're 35 and not married, there's four people that you would have that you could have dated in your life that you dated in your life that you could have married. And that just shocked me because that means that there's a lot of people who are meeting the right people, but they have no idea what they're looking at. Or the right people don't know they're looking at what, what they're looking at. Exactly. Thank you. Well, but, but again, we only attract people who are on the same level of differentiation as us. So we're right. going to have to put it. I'm putting it back on the person who's looking at themselves. And do you find that this applies regardless of physical appearance or, you know, obviously somebody who's very beautiful is going to attract more interest than someone who's not, someone who's wealthy, someone who's smart. What's your actual experience? Not about Mr. Right. It's about Mr. Right for me. It doesn't matter how attractive you are. It doesn't matter how much electromagnetic energy you're able to, to, to dispel to the world. So much people, sometimes people who are very attractive, they're giving out too much to the world and not enough to themselves. So true. So true. Wow, so this is really a fractal paradigm for all redemption of self and for all relationship with God. That's what I'm hearing. And I, I'm thinking... I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure you would confirm this, that that work, it's interesting because I had, I, I did an interview last week with, um, with somebody who was talking about who, who does, who's done work on mazel, on the idea of mazel being the spiritual source of the soul flowing down into the life. And, um, and he made a massive transformation. He lost 120 pounds, but not through, not by just by trying to lose weight, but he engaged in like understanding everything about the issue. And he had a total life transformation. He changed his personality. He, he got married to a wonderful, wonderful woman. He's like, and so many things are different. And he said something I've been thinking of and thinking of the entire week. And that is when you change your identity, you change your muzzle. So I think that's really uh, what, in other words, what you're saying when you I change your change. identity. What, sorry? Second order change. Yeah, change your well, identity. Change your model. I love that. Amazing. And that's really what we're here to do. That's so that's this is fundamentally a conversation about personal geula. Geula meaning a liberation from the confines of the of the false identity, the gullah self, the judge, the etadas, all, all of that tree of knowledge of good and evil, all of that stuff that's superimposed upon ourselves, that's keeping us from being ourselves. Which goes well, back to what you said in the beginning, the authentic, the more you can be the authentic self, the more you can be in a relationship. Wow, it's really intense. So um, did you want to add more to that or can I ask you a different question? I can, whatever you want, we can add more, or we can go on a different topic. I'm here, I'm here for you. Uh, I love the way you're going with flow. Um, okay, so, so I, you said in the beginning, 
So we, we, I have received this point. I'm sure the listeners have too. It's very, very powerful, very profound, very clear, and very practical also. So to anybody who's looking to change a relationship, to be in a relationship um, on any level, then obviously, or anything else in your life, change your identity. We could talk about how to change the identity. You mentioned some specific things. And maybe we should do that. But I also want to ask you, so you said in the beginning that, um, that, that, that there's, people are deceived by believing that there's a soulmate. But I want to take it from another perspective and ask you what you think of this, because I, I, I would propose that there are many soulmates. Um, define soulmate. I would define soulmate as somebody who's here to help you to do this process, whether overtly or covertly, whether by supporting you or whether by confronting you. But I think also there's soulmates, not just in marriage and not just in significant other. I think we have specific relationships, which could be sibling, which could be parents, which could be children, which could be friends that, that are different than, than the ordinary, that, that have, a, you know, sometimes we have a special attraction to somebody, a special or a special repulsion with somebody would you call that soulmate? Like, how could you speak to that whole soulmate thing from that perspective? You're, you're, there's so many different ways that we can go into this. So, okay. soulmate, um, or any, you know, I, I was recently looking at uh, a piece of uh, Hasidus, and uh, there was like an alluded to idea. And that alluded to idea was that, a, um, that we choose our parents. And that so many people say, oh, you know, I didn't show, I didn't chose, choose to be here. And we believe that you did choose. Your soul chose to come into this world. Right. So your soul chose to come to these parents at this time in this place. And so part of that personal gaula is also coming through with that inner child and dealing with all of those issues and all of the emotional issues and all of the physical issues and all of the mental issues and all of these things. I mean, well before you're trying to find the soulmate, you, you already have a soulmate. I, you know, I often, people ask me, how do you know this person to be good for me? And I say, you have to first look at the person who you're dating and see what the relationship is with the people they have to be around. Mm -hmm. The relationship with their friends is not that important but the relationship with the people they have to be around that's really important wow that's powerful what kind of, what kind of child are they what kind of if, if it's a second marriage and they have children what kind of parent are they what kind of person are they with the people they have to be around that's going to give you an idea of what kind of husband or wife they'll be your soulmate is a person who can see your shadow who you can be vulnerable enough to let them see your shadow and they will help you grow and become a better person. You know, we have this word that we use for soulmate, is there connecto? You know, this helpmate against us. It's really someone who's gonna be able to see us and help us grow. And I, I think, and we, I've been talking a lot about this with my colleague, Rabbi Yeshua Berkowitz, who's here with me. We talk a lot about this kind of stuff. And he said something very powerful to me. He said, I think that you have many, he, I, we all agree that we have many different types of soulmates, but we took two different types of soulmates. I think there's a soulmate that will just yes and you and a soulmate that will help you grow. And mm -hmm. I think some people go for the yes and soulmate, the one who's gonna smile and say, oh, you're amazing, you're wonderful, that's great. But how long is that gonna work for? And people do that, it could be their whole life, mm -hmm. but you see, that even maybe after five or six or even eight years of marriage, I'm not saying it's wrong. It's a choice that they made to go with somebody who's just gonna agree with them all the time is that they're still kids. They never grow. They never, they, they, they never went through the process, but someone who's your Ezer Konegdo, someone who's gonna help you grow and become a better person, that person is so powerful and a different kind of soulmate. The other one That's... could also be a soulmate. I think most of us look for, it's, it's so interesting. Most of us look, maybe that's not true what I was gonna say. I, I'm just thinking again of my personal story that um, when, your when your mother-in-law connected to, um, to a, a friend that you also know, who ended up like reaching out to me, um, she, she, this friend whose husband met my husband in Morristown asked, what he wanted and he said that he wanted someone who when he pushed would push back 
<laughs> give me what he was bargaining for. But it's so interesting that now that in the light of this, you know, I guess it's also the the the, soul, the super conscious, the soul tells us, I guess, what to want. I don't think I was thinking about that. And actually, I don't get so pushed so hard. But you're you're someone who's been working on yourself your whole life. So that that wouldn't that make sense? That if you're working on yourself, you're going to want to find someone who's going to push you back. You want to be be able to work on yourself in a better way than you did before with, when you're only half of a of a whole. Yeah. Yes. Except also, my husband is extremely supportive. Like he's very accepting. Like from the beginning, he was accepting. Well, you of don't the dark, of the darker side, which is also very you, healing. You don't Sorry. want to find someone who's going to be your 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 connect your your connect the high. You know, someone who's going to right. Right. You don't want someone who's going right. to love you, who's going to love you right. from who you are, who, who's going to love you and challenge you, and challenge you because they love you. Wow. This is so beautiful. So, it's, wow. So this is a process that, can you do this? Meanwhile, uh, obviously, if a person's not with somebody else, then they do need to do this, not in the presence of a significant other, but in the spirit or in the anticipation or in the so that's that's the soul of the other even if it's not yet in your life in a body is moving you already toward that process of self-rectification and self-liberation which is skula yes that's right hmm. and would you but it's not going to happen in a minute it's not going to happen from a two-hour or an hour conversation that you're that you're watching online. It's 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 a lot of self. I mean, it's easy to talk, right? It's easier said than done. But that process is a very very profound, difficult process of meeting yourself. Yeah, it seems like it takes. Well, I was going to. It takes a lifetime, but it's not really true. Like it, at some point, it's enough. I think it's important to build the relationship. I think it's important Sorry. saying this because a lot of people will say, oh my gosh, what you're saying, and I, I've heard this from others, well, what you're saying, I'll never reach it, so probably I should never get married. I've heard that from mm -hmm. people. And the answer is, no, at some point, you're going to realize that now I'm ready. If you start working on it and you start meeting yourself, saying the thing, letting it land, allowing yourself to be vulnerable, uh, first with yourself, maybe with someone else, maybe find a mentor, or someone you can speak to, a lot of therapy uses our self-presentation, doesn't allow us to be our authentic self. We think therapy does. And I'm not saying anything against therapy. Therapy is very on the ther It depends on the therapy. But some therapists don't know. Find a therapist or a mentor or someone you can speak to who will allow you to be your authentic self, who you can lean on, who you can actually become vulnerable with. This is unbelievable. This is so, this is so, you're bringing up so many memories. So when I moved from from New York to back to Minnesota, before I knew that I would meet my husband, and I gave up on meeting anybody, so to speak. I gave up gave up on staying where I didn't want to be to meet somebody. I started going. I I went to this like magnificent, amazing therapist who passed away not that long after I started. I maybe had six or eight sessions with him, and he cut right through the story right to the center, like in such a beautiful way. Second order change without a doubt. And there were a few other things that I did at the same time. And it didn't, and I guess then, I guess you, you do the process uh, for yourself until, you're, until you have space, until you have enough freedom from your junk or your story, your identity, that you are ready to meet somebody that is gonna be on the level that will allow you to grow together. You keep going into your, authentic self and differentiating and and supporting and rubbing up against and that's where and and the, and the change doesn't stop but the that level of change yeah so interesting it did not take very long at all i was there for just it was a number of months before i had to leave again because i got a number of months wow a number of months not a number of years a number of months and and I always say to the singles, you're being so selfish by not doing it because there's somebody wonderful out there waiting for you. They're waiting for you to do this. They're waiting for you to be a better person. And you're just being selfish by constantly being in your old, your old thing. You're, you're doing the same thing all over again, expecting different results. They call that insanity. You're, you're, you're so, 
Go ahead. No, sorry. I say to this a lot of singles, you know, you're, you're constantly, con you know, you're, you're being selfish by, there's someone waiting for you. There's someone incredible out there. You, so when you work with people, do you work with people when you have your, your, I forgot the name of it, jmontreal.com, which I'd like you to speak to very shortly. But when you work with people, when people come to you, obviously you do some kind of counseling. Do you have classes that people could go to? Because I'm thinking that, well, as we've said, it has to be that this process works in the same way, in a parallel way, no matter what it is that you feel like you're a victim of, like whether it would be money or whether it would be fitness or, um, uh, you know, any ordinary situation, any other than the extreme exception, as you've said, do you have a process that people could work with in that way? And yeah. why is it that, why is it like I ended up in this process? I think God pulled me into this process and it just was orchestrated for me. But um, if people can actually, do you think it would take months for people to go from a victim of poverty to, uh, to successfully attracting new circumstances? or anything like that, or have you not thought about it? I, I don't like to generalize, especially when it comes to these kind of things. So I have a lot of people who come to me and I have been able to take people through that process. I'm not a therapist, so I don't use therapy techniques. I, I use Hasidus techniques, Kabbalah techniques. I don't know therapy. Maybe I've, I've picked up different things, you know, called like pseudo psychology or you know, but the answer is yes, it can be done. But also I see a lot of people who will come to me and they're not ready for it. And that's okay. And I just right. call out and say, you're just not ready. It's okay. It's okay. Right. You're still an okay person, but there's no space in your life for someone else now. And that's okay. Or and something long, else. Or something else. And if you're okay with that, fine. If you're not okay with that, then ask yourself that question. Is there space in my wow. life for someone else? This is so provocative because, um, get, because you're, 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 you're calling out second order change. Um, many pieces are moving around in my brain right now. So it, looking at the, I forgot the term, the terms that you used, but um, the cost and the benefit, I don't remember what it, how you expressed it, but if, if a person is a victim in any situation following this logic, the way it looks to me, then you would say that there are more benefits in staying in the situation than there are in getting out of the situation. Losses and if a and person, gains. losses and gains. Okay, so if a person realizes that on the bigger order of things, they're more, they're with, in stage one, they have more gains than losses, but if they're willing to make the move, that uh, non-celebratory lonely move of going to the second order change, then they're going to be more losses than gains in staying stuck. And then it's gonna be a whole different ball game. Then what would be the next, do you have a process? Like, are there five steps? Like if, obviously there are lots of details, but if we wanted to sum this up, how does a person go from first, from just into a second order change process? Are there steps that could be defined? This is not BuzzFeed. There's no five steps. I'll bet there are. There are. <laughs> but, but it's very important to know, like I, I think about often when, when the Rebbe took on his leadership, he, he said that, you know, he said, well, in America, you have to have a mission statement. And what was the Rebbe's mission statement? It was love of God, love of people, and love of Torah as a triangle. And the Rebbe said, you can come into it at, from any point, you can, love of God leading to love of Torah and love of people, love of people leading to love of God and love of Torah, love of Torah leading to love of God and love of people. So there's no five steps that are linear. It's five steps that are fluid. So it depends on where you are. So I wouldn't wanna just say, yes, there's a lot of really great tools and I, I have a lot of exercises. I do different types of exercises with people, tools with people, uh, uh, definitely. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fluid process, not a linear process. Right. So do you work with groups? I do. I, the, one of the things that I've been doing now when I speak, I don't only speak now, I try to do practical workshops as well. And so it's about, you know, I, it's, it's very rare because most of the time when people bring me out, they want me to just like, you know, dazzle everybody. So I tell stories and jokes. And if you want that, I can be in self-presentation mode and I can tell you the stories and the jokes and make you all feel good and you go home afterwards. It's rare that I have the opportunity like we're having now 
to really be able to have a real authentic conversation and to do workshops with people and to really bring out some of the shadow side and bring out some of these things. And, and one, of the, one of the things that I'm working on right now is thank God as a rabbi and being that I've been doing a lot of matchmaking, I get often asked to do weddings. Mm. And I was standing under the chuppah a couple years ago and I had the glass of wine in my hand under the chuppah and I was about to make the blessing. And I looked at this beautiful couple in front of me at their chuppah on their wedding day. And I said to myself, what did I do to be able to make this blessing? I am now blessing this union. And I did nothing for this couple to bless this union. What gives me as a rabbi, because I studied and I became ordained, what gives me the right to bless this union? And at that moment, I decided that every single couple that comes to me, I am gonna do everything in my power to give them the tools, at least a toolbox. Wow. I went around and I said, there must be, I, mean, I can't believe I'm the first person to think of this. There must be a toolbox. There must be, someone must have made a premarital program. I looked in, I hate to use these labels. I think labels are for shirts, not for people. I went in the Orthodox world. I went in the conservative world and the reform. There is no Jewish program. Nothing for wow. rap. Nothing. So right Whoa. now I've taken on this challenge. I started with my own couples and I'm working together with this Dr. Asa Romanelli in Jerusalem. He's an amazing person. I think you should have him on your on, on your show sometime. And, and, Sense, and I, what's that mean? His, his information. He has a he has a podcast called Potential State where he has 75 different and I and I think it's imperative for everyone to listen to his stuff. His stuff is mm -hmm. unbelievable. I've never met anyone like him. He speaks the truth. And he spell his name so people could look him up. Sure, Dr. Asael, A S S A E L, Romanelli, which is R O M A N E L L I, Romanelli. He lives in Jerusalem. He mm. has his, his podcast is called Potential State. It's on iTunes, you know, uh, the Apple Podcasts and Spotify and Stitcher and all those wonderful things. And I would say to people, start from the beginning. He has 75 episodes now. Start from the beginning and go through a lot of the stuff I spoke about here are, are fundamentals that I took from his work. And uh, it's really allowed me to understand a lot of these very deep Hasidus and Kabbalah concepts in a very practical way. And so he and I are now working on a, 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 this project for rabbis to be able to become certified, to have some tools that they can actually meet with a couple three or four or five or six times. So when they stand under that chuppah, they can actually say, this couple deserves my blessing because I've done everything in my power to set them up for a long lasting and happy relationship. Wow. <laughs> a lot of things are going through me. Um, I'm feeling this in my heart. So I, the other thing that I'm, I don't know if I wanna say stuck, but I'm very focused on is what you've introduced here. And I don't think you're quite looking at it the same way I am yet. <laughs> I'm gonna try. Um, see if I can make that happen because it's very, very exciting. Not just for, I know you're busy, so I'm not trying, I know you're super busy. I'm not trying to make you more busy, but if you have a process that can be used in groups, um, that, that is a cap a, for, a pe for people who are ready as a catalyst for what I would call, you know, in the jargon, quantum change, second order change, we already defined it, second order change then it seems like it should be, um, I don't wanna say standardized because you can't, you're saying you can't standardize it, but truthfully, if you can do something in a group, it is standardized to a degree. There's a limited I, number of ways that you can, that you can work with things and- um, I, I there would train people to be able to do it. It's not a skill. It's a skill I can train people. I, the same way I, I can train people to be matchmakers. It's not a talent, it's a skill. I can train them to do this as well. Doesn't and, it take a certain personality that's willing to be blunt and not sidetracked and mm -hmm. that can discern between where, you know, in different states of where a person is at, first of all, if they're ready and if they're not ready and second of all, where to take them? I would say the, the person who can, who can do this is someone who's able to one down themselves, who's able to become vulnerable like this, like you and I having this, this, this time here, you becoming vulnerable to your listeners and your viewers here, that is the ability. The ability that you have to one down yourself and become vulnerable is a very powerful. One down means being vulnerable? 
I'm yeah, not familiar with the terms. There's, there's the term one upping, like where you're oh. more <laughs> grandiose. And I'm saying one, one down, like where you're Whoa. able to say, like, this is what I've done. This is the work that I've done. And I'm coming to you from my experience. And because this is something I've been working on my whole life. Right. I've, been, I've been battling my relationship with God my whole life. Now I can talk about God. And victimhood. And victimhood. And feelings of being broken and Absolutely. inability to move forward in various ways or to experience the things we want. That's Absolutely. universal. Wow. Saying the thing. So powerful just to say it. Just to be able to put it out there and say it. It's such a powerful experience. We don't give it enough. We don't give it enough time. We don't even let it land. We're just like always looking to answer and answer and answer. Just allowing it to land. Yeah, it was, I had a panel discussion with um, three, uh, three uh, women who are energy healers, who I, I know all of them um, quite well, personally, and they're all super, I'm, you know, for, forgive the term, but let's say evolved human beings, you know, they all work on themselves very, in very significant ways, and whatever they offer, it comes from having experience and having to break through. So one of the things that came out in that conversation was about, uh, I've started calling um, the, the, the limit, the negative limitations of the identity, the reactivity, the uh, the, the hiding, the self judgment, the projection, all of that. It's just call it snake energy. It's, it helps me to identify what's real and what's not real. Okay, so snake energy is a the raw material for Mashiach energy, without a doubt. But um, but but what I but what I'd like to, what you're, what is being called out in this in that what you're saying now is I think one of the key reasons why we can't one down ourselves, why we can't expose ourselves, why we can't be vulnerable. Expose has a little bit of bad buzz, but we, yeah. we can't be vulnerable is because we think it's just us. Like this is part of the craftiness of the fake energy. It's like, don't show anybody, nobody else, has, they, they don't, don't let them know they'll just, but it's really, there's one snake and it's just got like, it's like got tentacles and it's one's in here and one's in there and one's in there and one's in there and it, it, it becomes personalized. It becomes justified by our situation and by our, the way we brought up and, you know, the things we struggle with. And so we have to keep it secret. And I feel like, it, you know, knowing that it's our greatest actual potential power, like a superpower, um, is, is, it can really make a difference. It's really, uh, also, I'm just thinking, you know, one of the opinions about the Chet Eitz Adas, about what was, that it was the snake, right? Right. The, the fruit. So if we eat the... It's, it is the snake, whole, it's the snake energy. Yeah, yeah. So, the, so yeah. So, I, for people who don't understand, who don't know the reference, there are different opinions. It was not an apple that Adam and Eve ate. It, that's for sure. It was the different, just different opinions on which of the seven species, special uh, produce of Eretz Yisrael, fruits and of the land of Israel. But there's an opinion that it was the snake. And so, um, so what? So where was that leading? So if we realize that that's really at the core, then when we don't allow it to, when we realize that we, it's an internalization of potential that came out in all of these negative ways, it really gives a tremendous power and incentive to work with it and to, and to be willing to be open. I don't think it would take that much for it to become a real trend. I hope so. I mean, th that is, we, that is what Mashiach is. That is what Geula is, is that ability to be vulnerable and to be open. Mm -hmm. To, to, hmm. to tap into what we call in Kabbalah that feminine part of ourselves. Wow. One downing. One downing is feminine. So the rise of the, the feminine principle isn't, isn't about dominating. It's about opening yes. and, and sharing and allowing and inviting and trusting. And, and being the receiver. <sighs> being the receiver. Wow. I have to go in a few minutes, so I, I feel yes. bad. I know this is- No, 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 it's, it's great, it's great, it's great, it's great. <laughs> I just want to ask you to talk about, uh, just for momentarily, um, as we discussed before the call, the, 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 what you do for singles, and this I, I will say, Rabbi Bernath expressed, and obviously it's, you know, we, we promote Jews marrying Jews, um, so he, he facilitates that for Jewish singles, although these principles obviously are going to work for anybody and there should be that kind of service for people who are close to the Torah who are not Jewish. Maybe something um, we can work on together. I would yeah, very, I'd love that. I'd, I'd be very happy to work on that with you because I think that it's, uh, so I, I think that it's, it's not, would be not be very hard for us to set that up. Hmm. Okay, we'll, we'll have to talk about that. So, uh, well, it's, it's definitely a rising movement.
So, okay, so talk about you talk about what you do, what you do for people and how they could be involved if they want to. So one of the one of the things that I've realized is that there's uh, with our with our Facebook society, there's not enough face look. And we need to uh, there's very hard for people to meet. So I, you know, it's not about online dating, it's online meeting. That's mm -hmm. a very that's a very big distinction. Because so what I do is it's all matchmaker based. It's 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 private. People put a profile on a website. It's just because we bought some very strong um, algorithm. So actually, the computer is intelligent and will give me ideas that I would probably never thought on, on myself. And gives me I can literally look at two profiles side by side and see all the similarities between the two and set people mm -hmm. up. So um, the easiest way to do it. I have a lot of different sites. The easiest, the, the site that I work on primarily is jmontreal.com. That's jmontreal.com. If you can spell J and spell Montreal and <laughs> .com, you got it. And uh, if they put marketing code rabbi's gift, then they get a free month of this service. Rabbi's That's gift, no apostrophe? Nothing, just, just the word rabbi's gift, one word. They get a free month of, uh, of, of me matchmaking. Or one of my or one of the people on my team matchmaking for them and i'd be very very happy for them to to try if you know especially with the singles if i can help them and i think that perhaps we have another project that we have to work on and uh, that's definitely something that i can practically offer and obviously if anyone uh uh would like i don't like the word coaching but guiding if anyone needs guidance i'm happy to to work i work with a lot of uh, singles and couples and and try to help so them. you're saying one-to-one -one, so you do this kind of work one-to-one -one? i think it's it's best one-to-one -one. but you have limited time although you don't seem to show it um you have time for whatever you want to have time for in life right i don't know now we that's do. provocative <laughs> we do <laughs> how is that possible what do you mean how unless, anyway. unless we eliminate most of the things we think we want and we prioritize then we could make time for the most important things but you don't have unlimited time in the world anything that anyone can do anyone should do things that are unique to your purpose and mission are what you're supposed to do hmm. i think i heard that from the rebbe yes well so do you with this for the counseling offer do you uh, are you are you talking about counseling for any topic like if people want to break through in any area of life or specifically for and this is for Jews and non-Jews or specifically for Jews? It's about, it's about breaking through. And obviously I also work together with Dr. Romanelli who also does, you know, he'll take care of some of the more extreme uh, elements. Some Sometimes we actually have uh, um, singles and couples that we work on together because I'm not a therapist and sometimes I do need therapy and I definitely refer, recommend him because we're, we work on that same wavelength. Wow. So I can work on the spiritual side. He can work on the emotional uh, physical side so working together with a therapist for me is uh is worked well and i i recommend that and uh yes definitely so anything. And, if you want to see yourself if you want to see your shadow and if you're willing to to I, I i don't do the bs i don't i'm not gonna sit there and smile and listen to all your stories that's not my story <laughs> that saves time that that makes more time it does so is this for any people like or is it this also specifically for jewish Singles and couples? Anybody. 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 Open for anyone. I just want to tell you that Kelly, I don't know who Kelly is, but Kelly just wrote, okay, I'll remove happy items in my closet. Yay. Okay. Just for Kelly, <laughs> this, this whole thing was worth it. Well, I'm sure many more people than Kelly um, will be benefiting. This is really, truly trans transformational. It's a lot of fun and very, very mind opening. Okay, so to be continued, and is before you go, is there anything that you wish you had said that I didn't ask you and we didn't get to? And is there anything else you'd like to talk about in terms of what you're up to? Because you are a Renaissance man, and uh, I know there's a lot of interesting stuff under that hood. We can talk about, but I want to say one thing to the Kellys of the world: that if you want to look in, look look into yourself, Kelly, and see what's going on when you go home at night and you flip off your shoes and sit down on the couch and you take that sigh, you have to realize that the whole day you're on self-presentation mode. People who are in a relationship, they can't go, they can't have that extreme. They can't go home at night to nobody and take off their shoes and make that sigh because they have to go home to someone who, they, who faces them, who knows them, who has that deep, deep relationship with them, that emotional relationship, that into me see, 
They can't just have that extreme. And singles who have who have that way, they can be on real self-presentation mode the whole day because they know they go home and no one will see it. No one knows. But it's too dichotomous. It's too opposite. That's not the way the world was meant to be. So there are a lot of people out there doing that, never showing themselves to anyone? Never showing themselves to anyone. It's really easy and it's really comfortable. But this world is not about its comfort. The world is about being real, connected, being differentiated, being emotionally vulnerable, being truly feminine. That's what the world's about. Makes me want to cry to think of that. It's so lonely. So lonely. I think about it so much. I see so many people who are so lonely. Wow. They're not supposed to be lonely inside. That wasn't what God intended for us. And Hashem should, should bless all those lonely people, should give a real blessing to each one of them, that they be able to look inside deep within their soul and realize that that is not the ideal way to live. That there's a better way to live. And that, yeah, it's hard to be vulnerable. It's hard to, to let ourselves go. It's hard to, to lean on someone else. It's really, really hard. But it's so much better. And I know there's no applause for it because it's second order change because we require so much change, but it's so much more powerful. It's so great at the end. Maybe there's no applause in the beginning, but man, it's nothing we'll, better. We'll, we'll applause you through the process. We will. <laughs> And that really is what the Gi'ula Summit is about. And um, this was wonderful, really wonderful. Thank you so much. I Really very, very, very powerful, important, foundational. And um, this is what love's got to do with it. And it's, this is awakening, awakening Gi'ula. Personal Gi'ula begins with the beginning of awakening. And I hope that um, this, I'm sure that this is helping people to open and accelerate that awakening and I many blessings on all of your work I hope I hope to hear a lot more about it and maybe to collaborate and uh thanks so much thank you for everything that you do for even exposing this and allowing us all to be able to reach people that perhaps need to hear it and what you're doing is something that is just incredible and I had an opportunity to to watch some of the other presenters and and just seeing it from so many different sides. You're doing something absolutely extraordinary and Hashem should continue to bless all your work, everything that you do. Amen, amen. Thank you. We should have a chef now. Amen. Have a great okay. day. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.